Welcome back, everybody, to the show. Thanks for being here, as always. So if you're someone that has ever gone through some serious hardships and made it out on the other side, then you're going to want to listen to today's podcast. And I know that that applies to all of you because we've all been through shitty times in our lives. And sometimes we learn from them, sometimes we don't. And we are going to talk about the importance of growing from those hard times and getting through to the other side. My guest today is a renowned speaker, author, coach, father. He is known to be an up and coming thought leader that will inspire you to not only do more, but be more. His book, Extraordinary, The Distance Between Good and Great, will inspire anyone to learn the tools to make a more positive impact on their lives. Tony Robbins quotes, his book, Extraordinary, will give you the psychology and skills needed to bridge the gap between good and outstanding to take your life to the next level. Welcome, Mr. Cornell Thomas. Thank you. What a great introduction. <laughs> like, out of that introduction, I'm just sitting there, I'm like, who is, who this, is this guy that she's talking about? <laughs> I want to meet this cat. He sounds great. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, well, I'm happy to have you on. I, I love having people like you come on and I uh, like mixing it up between my science, nutrition, weight loss stuff to people like you who have this amazing energy about how to better our lives and just, you know, become better people in general. And I know that you back in, I think it was 2003, you had some serious hardship come down on you where your life basically took a complete turn. Yeah. And I know many of my listeners are going to be able to relate to those big life changes that really feel like at the moment is the worst thing that could possibly happen and how to come out of that. So can you tell us a little bit about what happened at that time for you? Yeah, I would say 1978 set me up for 2003. Okay. Right? So like, <laughs> my, my, my adversity growing up as a child is what helped me combat what happened in 2003. So like my father passed when I was three years old. And so my father passed, my mom was, you know, forced to raise five kids on her own. So the adver adversity for me started there. And I tell people all the time that if you're going through anything adverse, you have to remember that you've been there before. Yes. Not, not, not saying that it's not going to suck any less, but just <laughs> having the, like, knowing that you've been there before and you've gone through a storm before is just like letting you know that, okay, I can get through this one as well. Even though it's a different storm, it might be a different category storm, but I can get through this one as well. So in 2003, like, I discovered basketball at a very early, uh, very late age. I was 16 years old. And in the States, basketball, like kids are born and they're, you know, they're, it's pretty much their mom, you know, breastfeeding and then their a basketball is like handed to them, right? <laughs> so it's like, I was, I picked it up when I was 16 years old. So I was very behind the eight ball. And what I mean by that is I was just, I sucked. I was uncoordinated. I was like a baby deer. I was five foot six when I was a freshman. I was six foot two, like that next year. Oh, so like wow. I got all this height and none of the coordination. <laughs> So I was just like, I was, I was Bambi when Bambi first came out. It's just a baby deer. Just a baby That's deer. a good one. Just, just you, baby baby deer. Deer. Yeah. So I, I discovered basketball. I fell in love with it when I was 16 years old. I didn't go out. I didn't party. All I did was train. And I went through a lot of adversity, more adversity with basketball. It's just people telling me how bad I was and that I sucked and I would never play anywhere. And after my high, after high school, Obviously, no schools recruited me because I was still god awful. And I played, I, I worked two jobs, went to a junior college, freshman year, nothing really. Sophomore year, everything takes off. You know, first wow. team all conference, first team all region. It's like five year span. And so people, every, everybody sees where you land, right? So, like when you had one viewer for your show, people weren't paying attention, but now they're like, oh, wow, Karen's show is pretty cool. Yeah. It's like, oh, I wonder how she got there. She got there because she's been busting her ass, right? So, I go to North Dakota to play basketball, come back home. I'm working out with all NBA guys, guys that play in Europe, get a contract to play in Europe and Portugal at their top division. A week before I was supposed to go, I'm just shooting around with some friends and I go to the basket and I hear a pop. 
And so I fall on the ground. My buddies come running over. They go to help me up. I can't put anywhere in my right foot. I get myself to the hospital somehow. And my mom gets there. And the doctor says, okay, Cornell, we're going to grab the back of your calf muscle if you feel excruciating pain. Uh, you ruptured your Achilles tendon. We have to do surgery on Thursday. Now I'm supposed to leave that next Sunday. Oh, wow. And so the whole purpose of me playing professional basketball was so my mom never had to work again. Mm -hmm. You know, she worked three jobs since I can remember. So I was like, I just don't want her to be tired anymore. So I want to play professional basketball, give her the money. I'll play the game for free. I love the game. And that's the plan. And so that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, up until surgery, I can't remember to this day. And Thursday morning, they wheeled me in uh, for surgery. Thursday afternoon, they wheeled me out. I had a hard cast on from the middle of my thigh to the end of my foot. And then by Thursday night, my contract was voided. So uh, people always say, man, how that day must have been so rough that day. I was like, no, actually, the roughest day was the next day. Because mm -hmm. the next day, I'm sitting in my room. And my mom came in in the morning, kissed me on my forehead, and then I watched her walk to one of those three jobs. I told her she'd never work again. Oh, gosh. Ah. That was the roughest day. That's, so like, yeah. That, like, so when people say, you know, man, you know, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. I said, I'm like, I understand what you're going through. Like, I'm, I'm, and I still go through adversity. I'm not immune to it. But I said, sitting there in those four walls, looking at those four walls, and watching the woman who I love more than anything on this planet, drive off to one of those jobs. I told her she never have to work again. That was the hardest day of my life to that date. And I remember getting immediately pissed off because this is how we deal with change, right? We have like mm -hmm. denial, anger, and we go through the five steps and I'm, I'm pissed off. And then I started thinking about growing up with this woman and how we couldn't pay the light bill sometimes and the lights would be cut off. And she would just walk in and just start lighting candles, you know, and like giving out flashlights or we don't have any hot water and she'd mix the cold water boil it, mix it with uh, cold water in the bathtub, we take baths. So she was so solution-based. Mm -hmm. I'm like, bro, this is a problem for sure. Acknowledge it. But there's a solution. You know, in eight, nine months, you do what you're supposed to do. You're going to be able to recover from it. Now, will you be who you were before you got injured? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, so I called my best friend up. I told him to pick me up and take me to the gym two days later. And I shot from a chair for six months. Then I shot from a crutch, and then I was able to, like, finally start to work myself back. And, okay, so during the time, I just have to ask this, is yeah. during the time that you were deciding, like, in high school, that, okay, you know what, no, I'm going to pursue basketball, and I'm going to make this happen so that I can play professionally and do this for my mom. And looking back, were you ignoring the little voice inside of you that said, this isn't your path? Mm. So that's a great question. That's a beautiful question. And here's the thing. No, because I heard it, right? I tell people all the time, you can't let doubt stop your due. And even though I had that voice that was still talking to me, like, bro, we suck. Like that voice was like, dude, we're, t we're, we're not playing varsity on a four in 19 team. Like we're not getting time. I didn't let it stop my action because a lot of times when you hear that voice, that voice causes you to stop. You hear it and it says, you know what, Karen, I don't think you're good enough to do this. And if you listen to that voice long enough, you're going to say, you know what, I'm not good enough to do this. You're going to just echo it. So there's two sides to us, right? The voice that tells me I can do something is just so freaking loud that the other voice just gets, it's just background noise. It's white noise, right? So I heard that voice and I, I, even when I started to do what I'm doing now, like as I started to progress through my life and do different things, that voice doesn't go anywhere. That voice is just freaking waiting for adversity. That voice yeah. is like, man, I can't wait till some shit comes up. I'm going to freaking, I'm back, baby. Like that voice is going to jump in. Like I'm back. You just have to make sure that voice is a whisper and not yelling. Yeah. I think we need to realize that no matter who you are, that voice is always there. The voice of fear, it's there for a reason, which is to protect us. Like inside, we're, we're just meant to survive. Like our brain doesn't, it, if, it, if it picks up a thread of any sort, even emotional threat, yeah. it's going to send out those warning signals like, oh, you might not want to do this. And don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Someone, so and so is going to be better than you are. Yeah. And so many of us, I would say 90% of the time, we listen to the, to the fear, the voice of fear. And yeah. we don't move past it. So yeah. at what point, like, what do you feel was that like changing moment for you where it was like, 
okay, I need to, I need to move past this. Like, did you tell me you mo- you were really depressed for a while? <laughs> no. no, I was, I, I wish I could lie to you, but I'm going to keep it real with you. And it just, I think it's just because I, how I was, you know, brought up, like not coming from a lot. It's just, I looked at that injury a little bit different than someone else would. I looked at the injury like, Bro, I used to come home and, like, we used to not have something to eat sometimes. Like, my mom would, like, scrap and put something together just so we could eat. You know, so I was like, it took me a couple days, and then I was in the gym. And when I was in the gym, it was just physically, like, physically, it's not helping my basketball game. But mentally, it took me away for a couple of hours of the reality of the situation. Physical therapy was the same thing. I had the best nurses. I had these five little nurses and I'd be on this ball when I could finally stand on this wobble ball and they would try to pass me a basketball. And they'd say, Cornell, pass the ball, but not too quick. And I would just like, whip, like whipping the ball to them and they would be sweating by the time we finished the thing. But it just took my mind off it, right? Just if you, if you sit in it, if you sit in the crap and you stay there, that's where that depression and that, man, I can't do anything, I ain't, I'm worthless. That's where it comes in. You can't be stagnant in it. You have to move. That's so important. And when people tell you they don't go through stuff or nothing bothers them, they're full of crap. Yeah, they are. They're not human. I, like, I hate seeing self-help things where it's like, it's okay, pick yourself up. It's like, <laughs> no, I just lost like three family members and I got into a car accident and lost my leg. You're fine. No, I'm not fine. <laughs> like, I need to deal with this, right? And the way you unpack that is maybe different than someone else. So I don't, I never um, judge someone like their process, right? Like yeah. sometimes you have to, sometimes you need more time. I'm a, I'm a psycho. Like it's different for me. Like I'm a psychopath, <laughs> but like sometimes you need more time. So I think if we have empathy towards people and say the way Karen might process this is different than me and me just understanding that when you like, you go to funeral, sometimes you see someone and they're, they're like, fine. You're like, they just lost the person they love the most. And they're, because that might be the way they're handling it, mm-hmm. right? You don't know how they are behind closed doors, mm-hmm. right? And then you see people that, and they're just a wreck. Like they're just, I mean, months later, years later, they're just, you know, a wreck. It's like, it's all how you handle it. So I just handle things a little bit different. Like my mom's the same way. My mom is like sweetest woman in the world. But when things happen, she's like, okay, now what? Right. Yeah. And so at what point did you start to go, okay, let's now shift my focus i'm not going to be a basketball player anymore to i'm going to be this uh you know speaker author or, you know mindset coach you know where at what point did that shift for you well i'm a knucklehead so i didn't see the signs okay right? like god was like hey dummy <laughs> dummy <laughs> you're not supposed to be playing basketball well and that's I was, what I, that's what i was thinking when you're talking yeah. about them when i said like oh were you going against something <laughs> i was thinking too like what, what were you going against as far as god or the other per- whatever yeah. you want to believe in is trying to tell you actually you're not supposed to be playing basketball you're supposed to be over here as this yeah. person and yeah. maybe that's why the accident happened right for sure yeah. and when you're in it, like you can't recognize that. So I was mm-hmm. so tunnel vision focused. And I mean, Karen, this is my whole identity. Yes. was a basketball player. Yeah. There was nothing else. I was connected to basketball. Basketball was connected to, to me. So I just saw myself as Cornell, the basketball player. And then I got an opportunity to coach basketball. So I'm coaching basketball. And reluctantly, I didn't want to. I was 26 and the coach at my old junior college just left. And the athletic director came up to me, who was my old coach, and said, we have nobody where you coach. And I said no like a thousand times. And eventually I ended up coaching this team, and I have these group of young men that are from inner city areas, and their parents are just dropping them off and saying, can you make him into a man? And then just taking off. I'm 26. I don't know what it is to be a man. I'm still figuring it out now, right? And it's like, okay. But I realized at that point, like, I was put here to help people. I didn't know what capacity. The speaking thing was so far off in the stratosphere. I was just like, I'm going to be this like super dope coach and I'm going to beat all the teams and win the national tournament. And, you know, they're going to lift me up and Gatorade shower and all this stuff. <laughs> like, and that was still my mindset. So I coached junior college for six years. And then I go to this place called Blair Academy that has these big time high school basketball players. And I'm like an assistant coach. They had three NBA guys and, we're about to have my firstborn. So we're about to have Bryce. And um, I'm feeling like this different pull where it's like, 
it's not just basketball. There's more than basketball. And I talked to my friends who are coaching at these big schools and they'd say, yeah, you know, we get to the gym around 7.30 a.m. We come home like 11 p.m. And I'm thinking to myself, you grew up without a father. You have, you and your wife have a, a child coming, onto the, coming into this earth. This is what you want to pursue and not be in his life. But I still didn't know, like, well, what is the freaking answer? Like, what is it? And one day I'm on Facebook and for whatever reason, it was just my timeline was just the most negative stuff I've ever seen. It wasn't even during a debate. It was just like negative, right? And I'm like, this is people's coffee. Like people wake up and they're like, oh, so-and-so hates her, her, hates her boyfriend, right? Yeah. I was just like negative. I'm like, I got to do something different. So I had a book of, po the book was called Book of Positive Quotes. A friend gave it to me and I was just taking quotes out and I was putting it on my Facebook. I said, I'm going to do this every day. And people started to like it. I was like, okay, great. And then one day I wake up, it's super early in the morning. I can't find the book. And I'm like freaking out. And I'm like, okay, um, what do I do? And I wrote my own quote. And people still liked it. So I'm like, screw the book. I'm going to just write my own quote. So I just start writing my own quote. And like months go by and my friend goes, dude, where do you get your quotes from? And I'm like, no, well, you know, actually, <laughs> I'm, making, I'm making myself. And he goes, you should write a blog. I said, what the hell is a blog? And he goes, Let me, oh. so he started like a WordPress setup for me. I wrote my first blog in like this place called Panera Bread, this place where you eat in, in here. And it was called Risk. It was terrible. It was like a paragraph long. <laughs> and, <terrible. laughs> <God awful. laughs> and every Saturday I would write a blog and I would see people from like, Vietnam and from like these different places would be looking at my blog. I'm like, my words have this power. I was like, why don't I just go out and write a book? And my buddy's like, how are you going to write a book? I was like, I'm going to ask Google. Google usually knows. Yep. So I asked Google. Google's like, this is how you write a book. I read my first book called The Power of Positivity. And I'm like, okay, I want to speak. How are you going to speak? I don't know. I'm just going to say yes to everybody. I'm going to put it out there. Ask just, Google. Yes <laughs> yeah. Ask Google, Google. How do I speak? And I just started, I just started going out and I started speaking. Like I, I spoke, my first speaking gig was in front of 12 people at a dance studio and they were eating. It's like the worst case scenario, right? <laughs> I'm up there. They're just, it's like 14 people. They're just like, and I'm just like, <laughs> all right, be so impactful. They stop eating. That was the only goal like just be so impactful they stop eating oh, and eventually that. they stop chewing and i'm like great let's do this and so i'm like okay so this story it i got there's something here and then i just started going on speaking next thing you know i'm in like england and going to these different places and no speaker agent no speaker bureau representing me just me and like when people say i want to get into speaking but i don't know the right person i was like i didn't know anybody i knew no one you know what you do if you want to be a speaker? Believe in your message, practice, and don't suck. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. And be authentic. Like, and be authentic in terms of just be you. Me and you were talking before. It's like about just being ourselves. Like, just be yourself, right? And if you're yourself and what you say you believe, then people are going to gravitate towards that. If you're trying to be somebody different and you're fake, no one's going to gravitate. Like, you, people are going to resense bullshit. Like, you can smell it out. It's like, okay, this person definitely is not doing that you go on instagram you see seven gazillion six-figure earners sitting next to rented lamborghinis saying i can teach you how to do this and they don't have the money in the account yeah. right yeah so you and you can smile right away but then you see people that are real and you're like yo i like that person they stick out like a sore thumb that's why people like us we're gonna win because we're who we are you what you see is what you get mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the refreshing thing about the era we're in right now. If you have content and it's real, like it's your, like you're creative and you have content and people like you're a real person, you're not like a plastic person, you're going to win eventually. You just got to keep going. You got to keep, you know, working towards it. Which I think so many people th assume that you have to have this natural talent for something mm -hmm. when like, I love the fact that you're so open with saying, I've had to really work. I've came from nothing. Every time I've done something, I've come, I sucked at it. <laughs> you sucked at basketball. You sucked at blogging. You, you, know, no. you were really good at the positive quotes right away. But <laughs> no. That's about it. Right? But you, you still had the fear. And people yeah. think that they're, they need to have no fear in order to take that next step in their life when mm -hmm. it comes to changing careers, starting a new hobby, whatever it is. 
that you're going to have that you're waiting for the fear to go away and it's just not going to go away and you probably are going to suck at it for a while and it's going to take time, sure. right? In this day and age, we want this fast, quick fix gratification mm -hmm. and it's just not realistic, is it? Yeah, no. I love that. Like, I love, man, first off, like, man, your, your viewers are blessed. Right, because you drop. I mean, I can only imagine the nuggets that you hit them with on a daily basis. That's the first. I try, thing. yes. It's awesome. <laughs> Second, and I'm not just saying this. I'm saying because I'm like, when something hits me, I just have to say it. I'm sorry, but like you're talking, I'm like, wow, she says some really good stuff. Um, but it's, but it's so, but it's so true, right? Like, I'm. I've been speaking now professionally, like since I got the first dollar, about seven years, right? There are peaks and valleys. There are months where I'll speak five times. There are months where I speak once. And I've spoken Dubai, England, all over the place. But it's, I control my destiny. So if I'm going to reach out to a thousand places this week and say, I would love to speak at your event, I've got to put my ego aside and say, it doesn't matter that you did some TED Talk or Tony Robbins. Or, none of that crap matters. Because there's a lot of people that don't know who the hell you are, Jack. Yeah. So if you want to speak in Asia, if you want to speak in Australia, if you want to speak in these places, guess what? You have to do it. Unless you want to give someone else $5,000 a month to, to not do it or not represent you the way you can represent yourself. Right? So everything is work. I knew that I had the gift of gab. Like I knew I can speak to people. I didn't know what I was going to speak about. So I had to construct like, how do I, how do I frame my story? How do I say it where it's impactful? And it's not about me. It's about the people that are listening to me. Because in that story, if you hear me speak, which you will, because I know we're going to be best friends. Like, <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> duh. duh. So <laughs> when you hear me speak, like, it's, it's all, it's a series of stories. Mm -hmm. And in those stories are all the lessons. Mm -hmm. And people are like, man, I love listening to you because I can just follow the story. Or I can follow where you're going. I'm not like, hey, when I never made a mistake, this is what happened. Then the Lamborghini came and it flies because I'm rich. <laughs> well, I'm going to teach you exactly yeah. how to do this. And in 12 it. months, you're going to have a seven-figure business. <laughs> Just give me seven <laughs> figures so I can teach you and then I'll have a seven figures. Like, that's like, it's like, come on. It's like, you can't teach people how to be you. When people, when I coach people one-on-one -on -one and they want to be speakers, I'm like, this is in your voice. This is not in my voice. I don't want you to sound anything like me because you're not going to be able to do it. You can't replicate me just like I can't replicate you. Right. So make it in your voice. I, it's something so refreshing when someone comes along and you're like that dude or that girl's different. Mm -hmm. It's so cool to see that. It's like, even like when you see like a comedian or someone that like is new and you're like, Oh, that's fresh. Like, I like that. You know, like I look at like, when we just got on just doing the eye test. I look at you. I'm like, she's different. You know, like, yeah, she's from Canada. She's got the cool hair. Like, she's like, whatever, right? She doesn't look like everybody else that's out there. It's like, that's how I want to be when I walk on stage. It's like, you, I want people to look at me and say, oh, that dude's different. He's not like this. He's not super preachy or super whatever. Or not trying to be some, but like the million other speakers out there that are yeah. all trying to be like each other, right? Yeah, yeah. crazy. It's not cool. Crazy. And I, yes, and I'm just going to say, too, that like in my own journey, it, it it took me a long time and I feel like I still work on it all the time, which is don't get sucked into what everybody else is doing, mm. right? And you think, oh, to be the next best, whatever. And, and this can apply with to anything in your life when you're trying to make these changes and you're looking at so-and-so trying to compare yourself to them and thinking, I need to be like that person in order to get there. Well, that's not true. You need to find exactly how you need to do it with your own voice mm. and it's going to take work. And yeah. I know, if, and I don't know if, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but I got really stuck in the, law of attraction stuff. Like I got really into it, really into it for, mm -hmm. for years where I was, I kept thinking I need to think about things to manifest them. And I would Im imagine my life in a different means. And what does it feel like to have, um, you know, a huge growing business. And I got so caught up in the manifestation part of it that I stopped doing I stopped taking action and I let, and I let the fear, the voice of fear hold me back. And then, and 
and I would sit around and manifest thinking that that's how it was all going to come to me. And you see a lot of that, like when you're talking about these people on Instagram and Facebook saying with their Lamborghini, I'm going to help you make all this money if you do X, Y, Z. And I, you know, I got suckered into a lot of that stuff. Like, Oh yeah, tell me how you did. And then I, I was like, no, I can't sit around thinking about having the Lamborghini and it's going to show up on my doorstep. I actually have to go out and start doing and taking action in order for these things to happen. So what's your opinion on that, on the whole like manifestation? I know you talk a lot about positivity and maybe like what's the difference there between the law of attraction and just being a positive person? Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's honest, right? So it's beautiful and it's honest. And when people read The Secret, the mm-hmm. thing is, is they didn't realize that manifestation without action is nothing. Yes. It's nothing. I just now, did not know. It took me a long time. It is not just you. There are millions. Millions. I know. Millions. Being of duped. Yeah. They were like, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire. <laughs> Nobody. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a millionaire. Like when I read The Secret, right? This is right when I first, right when I first started writing the quotes, I was about to start getting into speaking. I looked at it and I said, okay, well, let's be honest. This has already been written before. Okay, so James Allen in 1902 wrote a book called As a Man Thinketh. It's the same thing. As he thinks, he act, like as he thinks he attracts. What do you think he attracts? So it's already been done. Every, anything that's ever been said already, I don't care who it's by, it's already been said. Yep. Right? It's just your different view of it. Now, when I read The Secret, what I took from the manifestation is my mom has always said everything happens for a reason. My mom has always kind of Based, loosely talked about the law of attraction without saying the law of attraction. The secret for me framed that into, like gave it a definition. Okay, what well, your mom has been saying to you a little bit and what you've been feeling, oh, that's called the law of attraction. So when I talk to my friend about a song or a movie and I go home and it's playing or mm-hmm. I see it, I'm, I manifested that. Now it's a scary thing if you're not open to it, right? It's a scary realm to mess with. Because when you start seeing things in your life that you were just talking about, and you start seeing how powerful that is, it's very easy to get duped into saying, okay, well, that's all I need to do, Mm -hmm. right? It's very easy to do that. It's not like, well, Karen, how did you fall? No, it happens all the time, right? What you have to do when it comes to the manifestation law of attraction, you can't, say, oh my God, I just had a bad thought. Oh my God, oh my God, what's going to happen? My house is going to blow up. You can't say that because it's not going to happen. Now, if every single day you said, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm terrible, I'm terrible. After a while, you're going to just believe it. It's the same thing. I want to speak on 100 stages this year. 100, I spoke at 47 last year. I'm speaking 100 this year. Well, now 90 because I already spoke on 10, right? How do I do that? Yeah, I can say that to myself. I can believe it. I can visualize myself on these stages, but I also have to message thousands of people. (laughs) Yes, yes, you do, damn it. (laughs) I have to message thousands of people because all I'm doing is, I I talked to a friend today and he was like, you know, how's things going and blah, blah, blah. I was like, I'm a seed planter. I plant seeds every single day and I write emails that don't get returned. And the thing I love about that the thing I love about people that don't return my emails is when you see me on a real global scale, you're going to check your inbox and really hate it. You're going to hate it. You're going to hate it so much. <laughs> that, and that's what, this is why we are connected. It's like, you're not returning that email to speak at your freaking dinky ass summit. Right. And then you're going to see like, uh, Oh, wait a second. I could have had that dude at my yes. event. Yeah. Like I could have had him speak at my university and I didn't. I could have had Karen speak at this and I didn't. Are you kidding me? I wrote a letter to Oprah in 2013. I wrote four letters, handwritten. I sent it to all of her uh, offices. And I said, you are not ever going to open this yourself. I said, you have too many people that do stuff for you. I said, at some point in time, if it, you know, God permits, and I'm sitting down in front of you, I'm gonna remind you that I never heard back from you. This is what I wrote in the letter. This is like, like I literally, my book wasn't even out yet. And I put <laughs> Cornell Thomas yeah. and, like, and just <laughs> sent it. Because if I go on a Super Soul Sunday or whatever it is, I'm gonna, yeah. the first thing I'm gonna say is, hey, oh, 
just so you know. Because I'm going to talk to her like, I'm going to keep it real. sister. Yeah, but sister, what's up? I'm like, you're just a human to me. Like, cool. You do cool stuff. But like me and Karen have way more fun. Um, I'm going to tell her. I'm going to say, look, I wrote you four letters in 2013. I sent it to your Chicago office, your New York office, your Los Angeles office, and wherever the other one is. I knew you weren't going to ever get it. But I knew that I'd be here one day if I decide to be here one day. Right. So I always look at that like you just keep planting seeds, keep continuing, keep grinding, keep doing what you're doing. And then when it takes off, you don't even have to come from a place like I told you I'd do it. They're going to see it. Like they're going to see Karen on Ellen and say, Is that the Karen that? Oh, wow. That I said no to. Yeah, that was <laughs> dumb. I tell people all the time stop trying to prove people wrong. It comes from a negative place. Prove yourself right. And if your goals are bigger than anybody else's expectations, you're not going to give a crap what people say. Like, you're, my, if I told you my goals, you'd be like, Cornell, you're nuts. Like, you wouldn't be. But like a normal human would be like, you're out of your mind, right? We're too busy comparing our lives. And I know this, you probably have this with your mm-hmm. clients a lot. Comparing our lives with other people's highlight reels on social media. Ugh. And that is the issue. Yeah. Because it's a highlight reel. If everybody posted the real stuff on social media, they'd be like, got diarrhea today. It's a mess. <laughs> like, that's what you get as a social media with me. My son just peed on me, killing the game. Uh, actually, my kids aren't this cute, <laughs> and I can't stand them and want to punch them out right now. Like, <laughs> Almost at my husband. Yeah. Couldn't find the knife. <laughs> Couldn't find the knife. Sorry. Hashtag Dang. love. Yeah, love. <laughs> that's why i don't i don't subscribe to these like valentine's day and all this other stuff like, oh. all the holiday and craps like valentine's day you know like the couple that you know is about to get divorced they have like rose petals <sighs> to the bed like loving my love bug oh it's, god it's like no. stop it stop it stop it stop it everybody stop comparing yourselves to everybody else stop it. and and listen to what he's saying and what i'm saying when it's when you are trying to make change in your life you are gonna maybe have to change courses a million times over and have that door shut in your face a million times over before one will finally open and I've I've had the same journey where I could like I've had people ask me straight up when I you know two years ago when I asked to be on their podcast they how well what are your numbers uh, how many subscribers do you have now how many followers do you have and I'm like oh whoa um, not very many what does it matter? <laughs> you know, and I promised myself when I got to where I am right now, sure. I will not ask people those questions. Yeah. If I want someone on my show, it's because I want to talk to that person. I know that they have value to give, not yeah. because they have 10,000 followers and can yeah. bring me more. Forget it. But how crazy is that? It's so like, crazy. You have a podcast, and especially when you have like guests on your podcast. It's all about, the, it's supposed to be about the conversation. Yeah. Does it matter if I, like, I'm pretty sure if Gandhi was alive, he'd be an interesting person to talk to. I know he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have Instagram. He wouldn't have Facebook. He wouldn't have any of that stuff. Because he doesn't have followers, do I not interview Gandhi? Exactly. Like, do I say, oh, he doesn't have, he doesn't have any followers. Like, there are so many great, amazing people that you just, they don't, they're not on social media. And that's fine. Like I'm, I'm working on a TV show right now um, called On Purpose, where I travel the world and I interview people that are not celebrities that are doing great things for humanity. That are not celebrities. <laughs> that are not celebrities. Oh, that's the big. That's that the, big the big thing, heavy. isn't it? Yeah, they're not. They celebrities. are celebrities. Yeah, they are celebrities. But they're, they're doing. Rocking it. Yep. Yes. And I want to make what they do viral. Like instead of the burping cat, right? Like I want to oh, make I what these it. amazing people are doing. Like. Make, there's a woman, her name is Jennifer Shum DePaul. She has this uh, company called Project Kind in New Jersey. Seven days a week, she goes to Newark, which is the inner city, and brings food, sandwiches. And it, it stopped being about the food and the sandwiches. It started being more about the conversation. She starts doing Facebook Lives and getting donations, like almost like live time, to get people off the streets, right? Doing this with no money whatsoever, pretty much. Wow. And just doing it because she cares. Now, she'll put a video out. And like myself and like some of her friends and whatever, like 20 people will like it. Then you have someone twerking on a sailboat and 5 million people will like it, right? And it's like, 
where is our like we where have are we up. at here people where is yeah. our priorities <laughs> I think we're we have a big stuff up. yeah <laughs> it's like yeah cool cardi b like she says funny stuff but there's a woman in north in like below 25 degree weather like out there with no jacket helping these people you know yeah. so i just look at things i look at this world this matrix that we live in and i say to myself there are people like Karen, there are people like Elle who introduced us, there's people like Jennifer. And the cool thing about this is we're finding each other. Yeah. And that's why I always think there's hope for the world because mm -hmm. why would we, con how would we connect? You know, like think about it. Like it's just so weird. And even with Elle's like, how would I connect with her? She's in LA, I'm in, you know, New Jersey. And it's like, we just find each other. Yeah. And that's the cool thing, right? And I think real attracts real. Mm -hmm. And that's why we we're meeting up and we're talking and now we're helping each other and each other grow and do what we have to do. So man, there's, it's a, there's a yeah. movement coming though, Cornell. There's mm -hmm. a, I feel it. I see it where, yes, it's, it's like this huge diverse, like fork in the road that's happening right now where so many people are being taken down the social media mania craze where they're addicted to their phones. Like a little sidetrack here. Like mm -hmm. I was at outside in the on a lake where there's n very little cell reception mm -hmm. playing hockey on the lake on the weekend around a bonfire okay and i noticed that a man is sitting beside me amongst all these people roasting hot dogs on the fire and he's on facebook and at first i think is he working and then i scooch closer and i spy and i realize <laughs> no he is scrolling Facebook yeah. right now and not just for, for two minutes to check something. He sits there and I watch him for an hour with his head down scrolling Facebook amongst all of these people. And I finally said to him, do you actually have cell service right now? And he's like, yeah, apparently, because I've been on here for a while. It seems fine. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I would be mortified if yeah. I was doing yeah. that. Yeah. Right? So it's, so, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. So there's this huge fork in the road of people that are getting more and more obsessed with social media, more mm -hmm. and more obsessed about accumulating things in their life, thinking that's going to bring them happiness. And then there's this growing movement of people like you and I, and probably so many of my listeners that we want something more. We're looking for more depth in our life. We're looking for those feelings of joy and purpose and mm positivity and there's that there's more to life and i remember hearing once on a documentary about happiness and they said the number one thing that can bring you happiness which ideally both these roads are looking for we want we, we're trying to find things that make us happy and mm -hmm. on one we're, we're looking for these dopamine hits on social media and by all these artificial things that we're wanting to buy and then these this other road but they said the hat that happiness they is number one to bring you happiness is giving. Hmm. And I just think like, like what you're talking about, you know, with your TV show, that's those, those are the people you're going out trying to find or who are the people that are giving something mm -hmm. to other people. And mm -hmm. if people could get onto that and realize that's actually one of the best ways to bring more joy into your life is by giving back somehow. Yeah. Right. I, that's beautiful. I had um, a friend of mine, uh, messaged me last week and he asked me about the show and I, I get in these moods sometimes where I'm just like you know f the man like I'm doing this like I'm and I was just in that mood right and so I have this guy that filmed the trailer this guy Colin his him and his wife this company karma pants they're phenomenal and I messaged them and I'm not gonna use all the language but I was like fired up I said bro I said we're doing this I'm like screw Netflix and Hulu and all this other all these other places. I said, we're going to do it. We're going to shoot it ourselves. I'm going to raise the money for it somehow. I said, we're going to put it on YouTube for free. And I was like, and we're going to do the seasons there. I was like, screw all of them. I was like, they don't want this kind of programming. They don't want that. You think freaking ABC wants a show about people giving and helping? You think Netflix wants, no, they want like the next Marvel or the next Avengers or they want a drama show or a reality show, whatever it is, right? So I'm like, we're going to do this a different route. I was like, screw all of them. We don't need any of them. And he was like, yeah, man. Like, I know he was probably like with his kids. I got them all like fired up. He's like, yeah, man. All right. He's like, yeah, screw them. I was like, exactly. I'm like, hang up the phone. I'm like, I was like, I got to calm down. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm too fired up. But I look at it. I was like, 
we're, we have the resources where your cell phone can, you know, you can run a business from your cell phone. We have YouTube. We can, if you have content, unlimited content, you know, you can make a YouTube channel. You can do Instagram videos. You can do lives. You can do, and you can put out whatever you want to put out. Now, if you want to put out that good, if you want to put out like this show and the things that you're doing, man, there's so many people that you can reach. If you want to put oh, out the opposite, there's so many more people you can reach right now. You want to put out the drama, the negativity, like there's plenty of, there's a, there's a big audience for it. But like you said, that audience, I think deep down inside, everybody's trying to find happiness. And the reason I call this world the matrix is because one, it's one of my favorite movies, but two, I think that it's not really about unplugging people or waking people up. It's just showing them that there's a different way, right? There's, Mm -hmm. if you only think there's one option and it's this negative course of social media and this, you got to do like drama stuff or really dangerous stuff um, to get viral or whatever. If you show them a different way, like, Hey man, giving is really cool. Like yeah. giving is so dope. Like if you show them that they're going to want to do it. And I think that the generation, like a couple of generations behind us, they're really purpose driven. These kids, like we just don't give them the benefit of the doubt. We didn't, I didn't have cell phones when I was growing up. You know, so like I didn't have anything to look at or stare at. So of course I was outside playing. I didn't have a freaking video game that looked like a movie. You know, I had like a VHS player and a Nintendo, you know, where you could barely see the characters. But this generation is like, they're like, okay, I want to help. Like, I want to give. Like, how do I? Like, that's how they're, they're, that's what they're asking. Yeah. So why don't we pour into them? When I go into universities and high schools, I get so fired up when I speak. Like, it gets so, because the energy, like, it's like they want more of it. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think we can shift people if we just keep throwing out what we're throwing oh, out. A hundred percent. I think you're wrong. You've got a little bit of a limiting belief there. I think Netflix will pick it up <laughs> because I think there is a desperate need for it. And if you look at people like Ellen DeGeneres, who's got the most number one talk show on TV, mm-hmm. the best moments on her show are when she highlights real people. Yep. Not, not celebrities, nope. real people doing some sort of act of goodness. And on and every Ellen, I can't wait for those. That's my favorite segments. Mm-hmm. And I cry yeah. every <laughs> single time. I just, oh, I tell my, do I make my daughter watch me? I'm like, oh my God, it's so nice. Look what they're doing. We need to do better things. Like <laughs> those are the best. And it's, it's everybody mm. agrees with it. Or, or yeah. these times where she highlights these real people and what are they doing? They're giving back in some way, shape or form. They're helping somebody else. Yeah. So you're wrong, Cornell. Yeah. You're going on you're right. Netflix. You're right. Oh, you're right. Like, and you're coming with me, Karen. I'm yeah. picking you. With it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love I it. Cool. I think it's, I think it's great. And, and honestly, I I feel that you hit it on the head. There's a there's a new movement coming, there is. and it's 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 under all the drama right now. Like there's a smoke here, and we're kind of under that. But slowly, as that smoke dissipates, we're gonna start taking off, and people are really like people like yourself and people in our circle are gonna really start exploding to the top, and you're gonna start seeing a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I I can't I totally agree. So for those that are listening that are going, okay, well, I am stuck in that place of fear and frozen and I'm not positive like you two are. (laughs) (laughs) What do you have to say to them to help get them going, to help them bring themselves out of that place of miss some people it'll be misery, you know, and they're going through that really hard time and they can't bounce back as easily as you and I could. Sure. Sure. I would say this uh, a couple things. First thing is uh, how heavy is the storm, right? Like I said, like how heavy is the storm? Now there's lots of storms. Like if you, when you lose someone, that's probably like one of the worst storms you can ever go through. It's different than like when you lose your job or, you know, you're you get broken up with. Like when you lose someone, like someone's no longer on this earth that you love. That's a very hard storm. I tell people all the time, don't beat yourself up for mourning. Don't beat yourself up for having human emotion. Positivity is not the absence of human emotion. It's just not living in negative emotion. That is my definition of positivity. So you just can't live in it. And you have to figure out something. All right. Is this going to stop the way I live? Right? Is this going to stop me from living? And the answer 99.999% of the times is no. So if I lose my job, is it going to stop me from living? No. Am I, if I had some reason, no. You're, if you have breath in your body, you can change your situation. 
And that's so important to understand. And I have empathy for people that are going through it because I go through it as well. But I know that sitting still and being angry and doing nothing about it is gonna keep you in the same place. And then when you wanna get really morbid, what you do is you take 100 marbles and you put them in a jar. And then you take out your age. And then you ask yourself, how much more time do I wanna waste? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, if you want, if you want to get, if you want to really get into it, because mm -hmm. honestly, if it all goes right, if it all goes perfect, you got a hundred years and then the earth is recycled. So when you take out those marbles and you see how many years that you have left and you say, okay, what do I want to do with this next 57 and how many years am I going to waste on something that's already happened that I can't control? Very important. And it's like, go through that, go through your stuff, man process however you process it but you can't stay in it because if you stay in it man you're wasting life there's so many people that you can that you could help that could help you that you could meet you know that person that broke up with you there's someone that's like i think we have thousands of soulmates and it's not just romantic it's friendships it's everything yeah, same. I like, there's someone that's just waiting waiting for you right so don't sit in it just keep moving forward mm -hmm. yeah i agree and, and i think too don't you think if you don't learn from those big mistakes and those or those big moments in your life that are the big hardships, mm -hmm. a lot of the time they'll repeat themselves. Like you go through it again, you know, whether let's say relationships is a really good one where, and I went through that myself. It was like mm -hmm. boyfriend after boyfriend, just fail, fail, <laughs> fail, fail. Like I could not have failed more, I thought, than anybody else at relationship. Like, mm -hmm. I think there was hundreds that I just I was like, mm -hmm. wow, this is, th I'm not, I don't have a good track record here. I guess I'm going to spend the rest of my life alone. Yeah. I'm going like, to, and yeah. then finally one day it was like, maybe life's trying to tell me something. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> what could I learn from this? But it had to get so bad, mm -hmm. so bad that I actually lost like the love, of the biggest love of my life I lost. And I was like, mm -hmm. not, not physically, like he didn't yeah. die but I had to end it. And it was like the tragic, tragic, like on yeah. the floor crying yep. for days going, my life's over. How could yep. this possibly be? I thought this was the man I was going to marry. And then going and it clicking, finally going, I'm not going to do this again until mm. I learn from this experience, because obviously I'm not listening to what life's mm. trying to tell me. And it's time to learn and grow from this yeah. and i took two years of like serious self like digging and mm -hmm. worked on my spirituality and, and really got rid of this old stuff and learned about why i was attracting these men into my life like this and i ended up attracting that same guy back into my life and it's now eight years eight years or nine years later we've been married <laughs> awesome right and it it's was awesome. like you just you have there comes a point where you have to start to listen if these things yeah. keep repeating themselves and you keep thinking why does why is life so hard on me why does these things keep happening yeah. well open your eyes people yeah. and start listening it's a we're, we're creatures of habit right yeah. so once you get on a pattern and you don't recognize it's a pattern you're just going to habitually do what you do and i heard something it's definitely not my own and i heard this and i thought this was freaking great so I was listening to a podcast and this guy said, he goes, they don't start, when you start playing video games, right? They don't start you at the, the last level. You start in the beginning. Why do you start in the beginning of the level? Because you have to accrue the skills to defeat the boss at the very end of the game. In a lot of the video games, they're patterns, right? You have to recognize the pattern. Okay, well, I didn't know there was an alligator there. So now I know after I died 30,000 times. So now I'm going to avoid the elevator. I'm going to go around the elevator, take the stairs. Oh, there's no shaft there. I fell down the elevator. Okay, now I know that the elevator shaft isn't there. And you start getting these skills and this knowledge, and you stop repeating the patterns that you did when you first started playing the video game. So when you get to the ball, she can kick his ass, because now you have all this skill. That is life in a nutshell, right? It's failing and failing and failing and failing and failing and learning from those failures hopefully and learning from those losses hopefully so you can get more skill and every once in a while you get hit with an old thing that you failed at but the cool thing is if you're taking the lessons from the loss you're gonna be you're gonna get past that a lot quicker than you did before yes and that's life and it's like what you said is a hundred percent true it's it's a pattern game 
Life is a pattern game. If you are finding the wrong guy or girl, and you're like, why am I only attracting losers? You gotta ask yourself, well, why are you only attracting losers? <laughs> what are you doing? Well, I keep meeting them at bars after 11 p.m. <laughs> well, Ooh, hello. Maybe. <laughs> that was definitely one maybe, of my problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe stop going to that bar, right? So I look at things like, you know, I, I, I love it because you look at life differently. I look at life, life differently. And we realize that there's more out there than this. This surface stuff that we see on a day-to-day mm-hmm. basis. Man, there's a whole other realm of consciousness. There's a whole other realm in general. And when you look at it, we are just little specks, right? We're like little small specks in this big universe galaxy. And we are just renters. We don't own anything. In 100 years, we'll all be gone. So what are you going to leave behind? My dad's been gone for 40 years and they named the street after him six years ago because of all the stuff that he did for the community and all the things that he's left behind. And I'm like, well, 300 years from now, if this world is still here, that sign is still going to be up. That had the Bobby Thomas way. That's the name of the street. I said, that's a legacy. You know, do something so powerful, so impactful for someone else where people want to construct something for you. Now that's dope. Like that's living. Yep. All right. Well, I'm going to end it there. That <laughs> note right there. <laughs> Let's leave it where you're going to make such an impact. They may just actually name a street after you. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> but no, I love it. But just even an impact on just even the people around you, right? Mm. To be the best that you can be. I think that that's, and, and be everything you, you know, in life and, that Mm -hmm. you can honestly be. I think it's great. Yeah, but thank you. I love it. I love the conversation. And we're probably going to have to have you on again because I feel like <laughs> we just kept going for another hour. We just, we just scratched the surface. Was yeah. that an hour? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't even know it was an hour. I was like, oh. I was <laughs> like, oh, okay. Another hour. We could have easily could have had another a, hour. Well, we'll have a part two. I'm going to have yeah. you back on for part two. This was great. Day. You need to come to one of my positivity summits and speak. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm a good speaker. <laughs> oh, I, know that. I know that already. Like, I know that already. I'm not even, it's not even a question. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> Would you, I have a question. Do you do workshops at all? Not yet. Okay. But, but so I keep just thinking I need to. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a speech. Because I think there's so much, like, I'm looking at you and, like, what you're saying. I'm like, there's, like, I'm already, like, planning your life for you. I'm like, there's so many different things that Karen <laughs> I wonder if she's doing all these things. There's so much stuff that Karen could do. I was like, you have a, you have a book out? No, I know. I don't, hey, all these things are coming, Cornell. They're coming. <laughs> Karen, all the things need to be done. Like you need to be doing all of that stuff. Like you have to. Get this dope podcast. The book has to come. How often are you speaking? Are you going out and speaking? Okay, hold on. I'm going to wrap yeah. this up. Oh, I'm I'm, I forgot we're still on. We're still, yeah, we're still on. <laughs> Now, before Cornell t- takes me and tells me what my future holds, I just want to say thank you, Cornell, for being on the show. <laughs> Don't mind me. 